And now, stand-up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe, it's time to Stand Up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as, if I look up clues online for Wordle, is the karma as bad as when I look up hints for the crossword? And with the tragic passing of Spinal Tap drummer Mick Shrimpton, should my cover band reunite just to rip through a few more versions of Hellhole? And now, the podcast host whose cover band could only be described as mildly amusing, Pete Dominic! Well, to be fair, that was actually the name of the cover band. We were mildly amusing. We only played the one gig, and, well, that's why. Hi, folks. Welcome to today's episode of Stand Up. I have two excellent guests joining me. First, my latest conversation with anti-racist author and writer, the great Tim Wise. And then, for the first time, surgeon and author and, I think, activist, I think it's fair to say, her name is Dana Suskind. She is an MD. She puts implants in children's ears, deaf children, so that they can hear. So she performs miracles pretty much every week, giving kids the ability to hear. But that's not enough. She is also the author of 30 Million Words, best-selling author of 30 Million Words, and now Parent Nation, Unlocking Every Child's Potential fulfilling society's promise it's so good and she is a, just an absolutely wonderful person a, a crazy life that she's had and she has done so much good in the world very excited for you to hear my first and hopefully not last conversation with dr dana suskind great talk with tim wise as always Both these conversations took place before last night's massive breaking news that Politico was reporting or got a leaked document that the Supreme Court has in fact voted to strike down the landmark Roe v. Wade decisions. This is an initial draft majority opinion. It was written by Justice Samuel Alito and it leaked and that's never happened as far as what I heard last night. The draft opinion, political rights, is a full-throated, unflinching repudiation of the 1973 decision which guaranteed federal constitutional protections of abortion rights and a subsequent 1992 decision, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, that largely maintained that right. Samuel Alito writes, we hold that Roe and Casey must be overturned. Well, how do you then do a podcast? How do you hear that news and then have all kinds of crazy stuff happening In my own life, I'm trying to get sympathy now, apparently, because it was hard to put together tonight's podcast, Esther, after hearing that information. I guess I'm not trying to get sympathy. I'm trying to maybe offer sympathy. If this news has and is creating a lot of problems for you, anxiety and stress and worry and fear, you are not alone. That is exactly how I feel, which is why I wanted to share that with you right now. So today's show, I've got great conversations. I've got I had a a whole bunch of news clips ready to put together when this news broke late last night. And so I've got a whole bunch of I'm just gathering audio for you to hear just different takes from all kinds of people that were on cable news last night. And I'll read some for you to give you just as much of a perspective on this as I can as you wake up in the morning, because that's how I'm going to get through producing this podcast for you to pick up hopefully as early as two in the morning on Tuesday, the 3rd of May, which is going to be a a really huge news day, obviously, as a result of this. Also, at 9.30 a.m. on Tuesday, May 2nd, most of you will probably have already, it's already going to uh, pass by the time you've heard my voice saying this, but I'll still post the audio. But if you get it before 9.30 a.m. on Monday, the 2nd of May, that's a.m., 9.30 a.m. East, I will be talking to Eric Siegel live, probably on Twitter, but check my Twitter feed, at Pete Dominic on Twitter, And I will let you know where we're going to be appearing either on Facebook or Twitter or even YouTube live. I'm going to try something new and then I'll share that audio in case you missed it on the Wednesday episode. So Eric Siegel, join me live. But right now I want to get to some of those audio clips. I'll read a few things. I'll play a few other clips and then we'll get to my conversations with Dr. Dana Suskind and Tim Wise. 
And I do just quickly want to say that part of the value of this podcast is that I actually do oftentimes do breaking news, whether it be the announcement that Joe Biden had officially won the election or the assassination of the Iranian general Soleiman or now this and other Supreme Court decisions and elections and even debates. I often am able to reach out to some of the smartest people in the world and ask the questions, hopefully, that you'd want to know the answers to to help process these major news issues and developments in our world and in our lives. That's a huge part of the podcast. And it's not just the podcast. Hopefully you're following on social media where I post a lot of those things as well. All right, enough promoting me. Thank you for all of you who have paid subscriptions to this podcast that allow for me to make it happen. And now it's time for the last 24. Hit it. Who am I saying hit it to? I mean, I actually play that sound effect off my board. So it was me telling myself to hit it. I'm quite the band leader. Mildly amusing. All right, let's start with Wendy Davis, who is a lawyer and a Democratic Party politician from Fort Worth, Texas. She represented at one point the 10th district in the Texas Senate. She ran for governor there. She was on MSNBC last night, along with Cecile Richards, another Texan who used to run Planned Parenthood, and the great Lawrence O'Donnell, who, as always, asks really good questions. And I want to play, just going to break these up for you, but I thought this was a really interesting an important conversation. So let's start with Wendy Davis. And I just couldn't edit this down. And I know some of you really like when I do the longer clips. And this is probably the longest I've seen someone talk on cable news. They do it a little more on the later hours. But she talks like four minutes here. And I just couldn't edit anything out. I'm here for all of this. I think it's important and a real call to arms. Wendy Davis, uh, this is the product of our politics, a vote for Republicans at every level, state legislature, governor, senator, uh, president has produced this decision. This is a, a Republican political success. This is one of the only policies they've been running on for decades. And now they have basically uh, realized that policy through the Supreme Court created by Republican presidents, uh, President, uh, the first President Bush, second President Bush and President Trump. Their nominees are all doing this uh, to the American people tonight. They're all delivering this decision. Uh, one of the things that I believed when I was working in the United States Senate with Republicans is that the overwhelming majority of Republican senators did not believe their own personal rhetoric about abortion, and they never expected to have to deliver on it in any way, and they expected to profit on fundraising over resistance to Roe versus Wade for the rest of their political lives. Uh, they are now going to have to live uh, with the success of this, what does this mean uh, to Republican politics in Texas? Well, it's going to be really fascinating to see what it means, Lawrence. And you're exactly right. I served in the Texas Senate with Republican senators who absolutely supported abortion rights and yet voted time and time again for laws that intruded upon those rights. And I think that lawmakers across this country and at the federal level have always believed that the court would continue to be a backstop. But with Donald Trump's appointments on the Supreme Court and with Mitch McConnell's U.S. Senate affirming those appointees to the Supreme Court, it changed the game. And now Republicans, for all of their rhetoric, are going to have to face a voting backlash on this issue. Here's the real challenge, though, Lawrence. Because the Supreme Court has also dramatically curtailed voting rights and because gerrymandering has become so extreme in state after state after state, even though the majority of people in states like the one that I live in disagree that Roe v. Wade should be overturned, absolutely support a person's right to make a decision about their own body, even though a majority of voters believe that, the deck is so stacked against them because of the way these districts are drawn to favor a majority of Republicans who are out of step with what they care about and who are only concerned about the few voters in their Republican primaries who are putting them 
into office. What that means is that statewide elections, like the one we have coming up in Texas in November, for Beto O'Rourke and other people down the ballot statewide, those elections have just taken on a new and incredible importance because redistricting cannot impact what happens in a statewide vote. And I hope that that will be our rallying cry in state after state after state, that we are going to do everything we can to elect statewide leaders who will make sure that in our states, this is not going to stand. And as Cecile said, if Republicans take control of Congress, we can say goodbye to states being able to do anything about it at all. So the stakes in the federal election in November just got even higher. And if that means that we have to fight like hell and do everything we can to make sure that we hold the House in November and that we not only hold the Senate, but we increase the number of Democratic senators there, then we've got to do everything we can to make that happen. Our rage will do us no good if we don't follow it with that kind of concrete action. I thought that was great analysis as well as a call to arms. She is really good and very strong and brilliant, as is Cecile Richards, who is also there and had this to say. Just one other point, Lawrence, because I, you know, I know there's discussion about what else will happen. Even safe states, even states like New York, like um, California, that have been passing more progressive laws, guarantee you this Republican Party takes over Congress this November. If that should pass, I can guarantee you House Bill 1 will be an abortion ban in this state. Make no mistake about it. They say it's about states' rights, but it's not. It is about taking away the right of women to make their own decision about pregnancy, and they will not stop. That's right. They will not stop. They have made that very clear. The only way they can be stopped is if we join together to do just that. So I didn't want to tell you this, but folks, we're the ones we've been waiting for. That's right. So I appreciate you being engaged and caring about these issues as you always have. And I hope that we can work together to try to find solutions as how to fight back. And now let's move on to... Joan Biskopic, she was on CNN last night where she is a legal analyst, also authored the biography of Chief Justice Roberts. And I think this three minutes is worth it as well from Anderson Cooper's CNN show last night. What is your initial reaction to this? My initial reaction is that it's stunning on so many levels. First of all, just for what's happening in America, we're talking about 50 years of precedent that it appears now will definitely be thrown out the window. The chief justice of the United States was already concerned about the integrity of the court and public opinion of the court in this moment as abortion rights are being dissolved nationwide appear to be being dissolved nationwide. And frankly, a lot of what's in this opinion does jibe with what I'd been hearing myself in my reporting, although I don't I want to make clear that we have not authenticated this document ourselves. But we know that a lot of it rings true with what we've been told already. But to have it come out this way, uh, to have this first draft, and it's uh, typically it's one of many drafts that will be uh, amended through the next couple of weeks, but it looks like it's about to sail through at least five justices, probably just five justices, ready to overturn Roe v. Wade. The chief justice, who likely was not part of that vote, because uh, what we believe is that the chief was ready to uphold the Mississippi law that was a ban on abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy, that he had the majority for that part of it, a six-justice majority, but he is not with what appears to be Samuel Alito writing for a five-justice majority that would be Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, and the three uh, new appointees of President Donald Trump. Again, this is what uh, Politico was reporting as part of this draft. But as I say, this all rings very true and very troubling. And for the chief justice to see this case at this moment unfold publicly like this, I think that uh, I'm sure he will try to get to the bottom of how this all happened. You know, there's been a lot of talk about how this was leaked, whether it was leaked. It was really in the interest of no one of the nine justices to have it come out like this. The conservatives apparently have won. 
They didn't need to have it come out, out like this. It would come out at the end of June. That's when the law would be changed, when abortion rights, you know, from 1973 would be rolled back. It would not be in the interest of the three liberals, who I'm sure are dissenting vigorously. We don't know yet whether the uh, first drafts from the centers had been circulated, because all we have is apparently this one first draft for the majority. So there's so many unanswered uh, questions about how uh, Justice Alito's colleagues would be reacting to this. But you know, Anderson, this was the biggest case of this term, the biggest case of the decade in some ways. And to have it burst forth on the American public like this is, uh, to use a word that John Roberts used in his own confirmation hearing, a jolt and 10 times the jolt. All right. There you go. That is John Roberts' biographer and CNN legal analyst, Joan Biskopic. And I thought that analysis was also really interesting. A couple of tweets for you. How about that? Dr. Leah Torres tweeted, abortion is health care. Abortion is self-determination. Abortion is freedom. Abortion is moral. Abortion is ethical. Abortion is responsible. Abortion is normal. I like this guy, uh, Kent Greenfeld, simply tweeted, but her emails. It's hard to know who to have more kind of anger towards the anti-abortion people in the world and the Republican legislators or the progressives and the Democrats who were against Hillary Clinton as the nominee because she was so far from perfect. Well, this is what we got, as you just heard that CNN legal analysts say Trump got three. Count them. Amy Coney Barrett, Brett Kavanaugh, and Judge Gorsuch, whatever his first name is. I can't even think of it. I don't care. It's probably Brett as well. All right, it's Neil. It just came to me. Anyway, here's Lawrence Tribe's tweet. If the Alito opinion ravaging Roe and Casey ends up being the opinion of the court, it will unravel many basic rights beyond abortion and will go further than returning the issue to the state's it will enable a GOP Congress to enact a nationwide ban on abortion and contraception. Anthony Michael Kreese, who is a colleague of Professor Eric Siegel's, writes, This draft opinion overturning Roe and Casey is not just an imminent threat to women. It's a broad attack on the right to privacy and the fundamental rights enjoyed by women and sexual minorities. Nobody is safe from the United States Supreme Court's radicalism. Nobody. Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon writes, Women were called hysterical for sounding the alarm about abortion rights. We were told Roe and Casey were settled law. This leaked opinion shows we were right to be terrified. The Senate must now move past the Women's Health Protection Act to pass the Women's Health Protection Act. And as I'm speaking here, almost around midnight, more and more people are gathering in front of the Supreme Court for what seems to be a peaceful vigil at this point. But who knows where it's going to be. When the sun comes up, if it does, will the sun come up after this decision is made? It will, folks. And we got to get up with it. All right. More analysis. If abortion rights are able to be overturned, what does that mean for gay rights and other rights that so many people generations have won through lifelong fights? All right. Enough for me. Let's go back to CNN where Jeffrey Tubin. I'm not going to make any jokes. Trevor, Trevor Noah had some good ones, though, about Jeffrey Tubin at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Anyway, Don Lemon asked Jeffrey Tubin if he thought what other rights could be overturned. This is two minutes and 30 seconds of great analysis, I think. The precedent um, that could now be in jeopardy. Um, Same-sex marriage um, is, is certainly – this came up a lot during the confirmation hearings of, of Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson – that uh, it is quite clear that the Republican majority, in, in the, the Republican politicians at least, feel like uh, this is the time to roll back a whole series of, of uh, opinions that were passed when the Supreme Court had a very different majority. I mean, you know, this should not be a surprise. When Donald Trump ran for president in 2016, he could not have been more explicit. He said over and over again, I will appoint justices to the Supreme Court who will vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. And what I think he meant by that was he was going to appoint justices to the Supreme Court 
who will vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. And if this leak, leak is accurate, and I have every reason to believe that it is, that's precisely what happened. And, you know, when, when Democrats have tried to point, call attention to this, people have said, oh, they're overreacting, they're panicking, it's not true, Roe v. Wade's been around for 50 years, no one's going to ever overturn it. Well, take a look at this. This is what Republicans and conservatives have been trying to do for decades. And it looks like they succeeded. And, you know, the Supreme Court, one of my favorite quotes about the Supreme Court is that uh, from Justice Robert Jackson. He said, we are not final because we are infallible. We are infallible because we are final. This is it. This is what the Supreme Court has said. Abortion is no longer a right that all American women have anymore. It's now up to the state legislatures, which are mostly dominated by men, that uh, they are the ones who are going to decide whether women have the right to abortion anymore, not the Constitution. OK, there you go. That is Jeffrey Tubin on CNN last night with a dramatic and, and I think accurate analysis there. And I love Congressman Jamie Raskin. He is also a constitutional law scholar. He's a constitutional lawyer and a congressman, of course. He was on MSNBC last night with Rachel Maddow. And he basically said this is a full on example of The Handmaid's Tale, the notorious novel written by Margaret Atwood that describes a dystopian world in which women are forced to give birth by the state. Here's Jamie Raskin breaking this down in a very interesting way. And he talks here for about five minutes to Rachel Maddow, which I really appreciated. And I'm going to share. Well, this is just the, the first answer. They had a longer interview, but I want to share this first answer from Jamie Raskin, which is a real, I think, great argument and lesson in history. Have you had a chance to look at Mr. Gerstein's reporting at Politico or, or at all at the at the ruling that has been published tonight from the court? Yes, I, I just sped read the decision. Uh, I found it uh, astonishing and appalling. Um, you know, the, the, the basic uh, legal claim here is that the word abortion doesn't appear in the Constitution. And of course, uh, it doesn't appear in the Constitution. But the Supreme Court in 1973 in Roe versus Wade uh, hinged its reasoning on Griswold versus Connecticut, which was uh, a 19... Uh, 65 decision by the Supreme Court striking down a law banning birth control, even for married couples in Connecticut. And the Supreme Court said that the due process liberty clause includes a right to privacy uh, over intimate decision making. So the point is that uh, Justice Alito's decision would apply also presumably to the right to privacy in contraception. And we know, of course, there is a right-wing war on contraception now. But uh, if Casey is to fall, if Roe versus Wade is to fall, then Griswold versus Connecticut presumably uh, is to fall as well, because the word contraception or birth control doesn't appear in the Constitution. Indeed, the phrase right to privacy doesn't uh, appear in the Constitution. So this would appear to be an invitation to have, you know, a Handmaid's Tale type um, anti-feminist uh, uh, regulation and legislation all over the country. And all of that is perfectly in keeping with uh, Justice Alito's opinion, which admittedly I just read in like the last 20 minutes. But uh, to my mind, uh, it situates the, the trajectory of the American right um, in where, you know, Fox News and Tucker Carlson want to go, which is to make us in, uh, in the image of Hungarian illiberal democracy now to keep uh, elections going where people can be whipped up about various scapegoats, but to carve out and destroy the freedoms and the rights of the people. And that's where the right wing seems to be going uh, with this decision. And the Supreme Court, uh, if it actually goes through, uh, with this majority draft opinion, which somehow is uh, leaked out and which does look to me uh, completely real or at least an extraordinary forgery of what a Supreme Court decision by Justice Alito looks like and sounds like. But if it does go forward with it, um, I believe that the court will have returned to its 
historic baseline of being uh, a reactionary conservative institution uh, to the far right of everything else at the federal level um, in the government. And, you know, it's still got this lingering faint halo around it from the war in court period with Brown versus Board and Roe versus Wade, Griswold versus Connecticut, Miranda versus Arizona. But for most of the, our history, take all the way up to the Civil War, the Supreme Court, for example, never did anything for enslaved Americans other than to cement and constitutionalize the system of slavery in the Dred Scott decision and to declare that African Americans have no rights that the white man is bound to respect and to declare that the Constitution is indeed a white man's compact. And then even after the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments, the court articulated American apartheid in Plessy versus uh, Ferguson, uh, approving um, Jim Crow arrangements throughout most of the country. So there was that brief few decade period with the Warren Court, but then with the Burger Court, the Rehnquist Court, and now the Roberts Court, the Supreme Court has returned to that traditional baseline. And all, all it means to me, at least in my mind, and uh, admittedly I'm speaking as a person in politics, but we need to turn out the vote like we've never turned out the vote before. The people need to stand up and defend democratic institutions and the rights of the people because the Supreme Court is certainly not doing anything for us. So it'll be interesting to sit here and kind of analyze and comment about the political consequences of this leaking right now. What does it mean? But I just have a feeling and, and really no doubt that is going to be a, a summer of protest. That decision will officially come down at some point in June, but there will be organizing between now and then, obviously, and all through the summer up until the November elections is my guess. That's my prediction. It's going to get hot in here. That's for sure. 2020 was the summer for Black Lives Matter, maybe. And this 2022 will be the summer for women's rights. I don't know why I have to separate the two or even make that comment, but that's, I think, why I'm saying it based on the summer of 2020 and, and what happened during COVID, however. So we'll see what it leads to. OK, well, I hate to do this to you, but I do want to give you some perspective on what is being said on Fox News last night by notorious anti-abortion activist and very influential commentator, because, of course, she's a woman and this is not very common opinion amongst women. In fact, I saw Tina Winsett sharing this data in our Discord for subscribers using the Discord platforming last night all the time, and especially when breaking news happens. Uh, the data for data for progress, there is not a single state where support for a federal ban on abortion has more than 30 percent support among the public. But that didn't stop Fox News with Laura Ingram from saying, you know, if you don't like it, you can just move. Well, and I, I everyone has to remember tonight, like before everybody freaks out that this is now going to be determined by you, the people Yeah. like you can move to you could live in New York and you say, look, remember, New York did that standing ovation in Albany. Oh. You want to know what sick is? It's not safe, legal and rare anymore. In New York, you get a standing ovation for having abortion up until basically the baby, you know, is out of the womb. Mm -hmm. They were they stood and give the standing ovation for the most liberal abortion law, I believe, in the United States is in New York. Mm -hmm. They gave it a standing ovation. OK, that's what the people in New York want. M people in Mississippi, they want something different. That's how our framers understood our country. It wasn't one size fits all. So that's how it's going to work. Yeah, not necessarily. That's not necessarily how it's going to work. As Lawrence Tribe tweeted, it will enable a GOP Congress to enact a nationwide ban on abortion and contraception. It could possibly get far, far worse than what even Laura Ingram is saying, which is, by the way, so reprehensible. If you don't like it, move. Good Lord, woman. And of course, they're not outraged about the decision. They're outraged about the leak. Did protesters are enraged at that leaked ruling from Politico tonight regarding Roe versus Wade. They're outraged not about the leak. They're outraged about what's in the decision. Right. Thank you for clearing that up, Laura Ingram. She's a real patriot. Let's stay at Fox News with the deplorable Sean Hannity, who gave his constitutional conservative argument against abortion, but didn't really know what Dershowitz's take was on it. And Dershowitz didn't really 
give his take on it. He just said he didn't think it should be overturned. Here's that. And that it actually is the role of states to make their own laws here. And it wasn't the right of the federal government. I'm curious as on your position. Well, I strongly oppose overruling Roe versus Wade after 50 years, but I think it will be overruled. I am less skeptical than you are. I know Justice Alito. I know his writings. This sounds like a decision, a majority decision of the Supreme Court overruling Roe versus Wade. And I have a theory, and it's only a theory. I think this was leaked by a liberal law clerk who is trying to change the outcome of the case either by putting pressure on some of the justices to change their mind or by getting Congress to pack the court even before June, which is very unlikely, or to get Congress to pass a national right to abortion law, which would apply to all the states. And that would have to come to the Supreme Court to see whether that could be upheld under the Commerce Clause. But I think this is real. And I think that my theory is that it was leaked by somebody who wants to change the outcome. Look, I've been watching the Supreme Court for 55 years, and this has all the hallmarks of reality, and it does not have the hallmark of a decision that's likely to be changed. Maybe oh. Justice Chief Justice Roberts will go with the minority, but I think they seem to have five votes at this point to overrule Roe versus Wade. So there is the Dershowitz analysis, and then there's more from him because Hannity asked him and was focused, of course, they shifted and pivoted more to focus, I think, on the leak because the outcome of the decision in women's lives is too horrific to talk about on those channels and they're in denial about, I think, what this means potentially politically, but nonetheless, still an interesting question. I've never I can't think of an instance, not one, that a leak like this ever occurred. Can you? Never has. It never has. And it could only be done if somebody thinks this is an act of civil disobedience, an act which might get him disbarred, fired from the Supreme Court or her if it's a law clerk. And yet. They want to go to the mat because they think there's one chance to try to preserve a Roe versus Wade, and that's by leaking this decision to Politico. They didn't leak it to Fox. They leaked it to Politico. And um, so it, it fits together. I, I, it's just a theory. I have no information to support it, but it seems to me the most plausible Greg, theory as to who leaked it, why it was leaked, and yeah. how this does sound like it's extremely realistic. All right. Well, I will have more at 930 a.m. live at Tuesday morning. And I might even go on di on the either Discord or set up a Zoom for subscribers to just have a place to talk about and, and discuss this. But we'll talk more with Siegel about it. I'm sure you'll have a lot of thoughts about it. Emailing me your reactions or tweet me at Pete Dominic. Email stand up with Pete. At gmail.com, let's quickly check in with the other major event last night. It was the Met Gala, where famous people show up in all kinds of different costumes. And, of course, it's at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. And Elon Musk was there, dressed as Mussolini, if you can believe it. No, I'm kidding. He was actually wearing a boring tuxedo. Here he is on the red carpet, being asked, I think, a good and relevant question by the fashion reporter. Also, I'm sure everyone is asking you and wants to talk about this big Twitter purchase. What can you tell us about what you're going to bring to Twitter now? <laughs> well, the, 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 my, my goal, um, uh, assuming uh, everything gets done, um, would be to make Twitter as uh, inclusive as possible um, and to have as, as broad a swath of, of the country and the rest of the world on Twitter and, and that they find it uh, interesting and entertaining and funny. Um, and that it makes their life better. All right, I'll take things that are never going to happen for 200, Alex. Moving on to one more guest on the red carpet. It was Hillary Clinton. The former first lady and secretary of state drew inspiration for the Met Gala from the women of America's past who have impacted her. Her gown was embroidered with the names of famed women that she admires. We're all happy to be back together supporting the museum and the Costume Institute. Uh, and also celebrating America, uh, the uh, not just fashion of America, but really the spirit of America. And so when I was thinking about my dress, um, I talked with Joseph Alteruza, who is a wonderful young designer, as you know, and he suggested some embroidery of meaningful words. And I said, well, what about 
American women in the past who have inspired me. So I would have filled the entire dress. <laughs> uh, we decided to stick with women who were no longer with us because that would have really made it impossible to have even one dress um, if I had everyone on it that I admire. Uh, so this, you know, we have everyone from Abigail Adams and Sacagawea to Harriet Tubman to Eleanor Roosevelt to Shirley Chisholm to Madeleine Albright, who we just lost. And I thought it would be historic to wear a dress like that and really in keeping with the evening. All right. Now, that sounds like a fun event that I will never be invited to. But if I were, I don't know. What would I dress up as? What inspires me? Nature. I think I would, yeah, I would dress up like a bird. I would be a bird of some sort, maybe a tree. And then I would explain on the red carpet how inspired I am by nature. And I would make a statement about how we have to conserve it. It would be amazing, but it's never going to happen. So I think you heard the closest version of it. Let's head over to MSNBC for some more breaking news from yesterday, which is serious and important. I don't think it needs any setup. The news and a little bit of analysis from MSNBC yesterday. A jury in Washington, D.C. has just delivered a verdict, and that's in the case against former New York City police officer Thomas Webster. Webster was seen on video attacking police with a flagpole. Also breaking this hour, the January 6th committee just sent letters to three sitting Republican members of Congress asking them to cooperate with this investigation. So joining us now, we have Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale and justice reporter Ryan Riley. Ryan, let's start with you and this breaking news on the Webster case. What was the jury's verdict? It was a clean sweep for DOJ here. They convicted this defendant, Thomas uh, Webster, on all six counts, including felony assault and civil disorder. So really a pretty quick verdict from the jury here, which only began deliberating in the very late hours on Friday. So probably around three hours of total deliberation time. And what one of the jurors told our producer outside of the court was that there was really no dissension. It was a pretty easy verdict. And that's what DOJ really encouraged here during closing arguments. They said that this is a really simple case and that they said that, they, frankly, the defendant's story that he was trying to tell, which was that he was attacked by this police officer first and was only trying to defend himself, wasn't credible based on the video. And that's pretty evident since this is captured from multiple angles. All right. We're going to hear a lot more on that. By the way, the news on the abortion, overturning abortion broke at some point during the Met Gala. So Hillary Clinton certainly didn't know about it or else I think she would have mentioned it, or at least I wouldn't have played that clip out of context. I don't know why I thought that was worth mentioning, but I wonder if people were wondering if she was there celebrating all those women and uh, and then that happened. So, OK, she was probably told. I guarantee she was told while she was there and she probably got in the car. and was like, you know, what? I better go home. This doesn't look good anymore and take off my dress inspired by women and, and put on my suit and fight. Hopefully that's what I want to believe. OK, so here is Elizabeth Warren actually on the Senate floor yesterday talking about why it was really important to pass a law preserving women's right to abortion. The United States is facing surging rates of sexually transmitted infections. On top of that, Americans are facing rampant attacks on abortion and reproductive rights all across this country. Abortion has been virtually inaccessible to millions of Texans for several months now. And even though the majority of Americans, the majority of Americans agree that Roe versus Wade should remain the law of the land, the Supreme Court is poised to overturn the decision in just two months. Meanwhile, Republican-controlled state legislatures, emboldened by our extremist Supreme Court, have passed over 500 anti-abortion bills this year alone. And just this month, three more states enacted clearly unconstitutional attacks on abortion, counting on an extremist Supreme Court to back them up later on. And that is why now is the time to strengthen and expand access to critical birth control and other essential health care services that the Title X program provides. Okay, provides. I think I cut her off there. And finally, my 
Last piece of audio comes from the PBS NewsHour with Judy Woodruff, who is talking about the largest wildfire currently burning in America in New Mexico. The biggest wildfire in the U.S. kept getting bigger today after destroying or damaging more than 170 homes in recent days. The fire is burning in northeastern New Mexico near the small community of Las Vegas. It has scorched about 190 square miles so far. Fast-moving flames forced more people to leave today, following those who got out Sunday. All right, well, that's all the depressing sound bites I've got for you, but I do have more headlines and what we call the news dump. And this, of course, another jingle from the great Pete Co. And today's news dump story comes from Benny Alexander, who, back to the Discord platform that subscribers, listeners, subscribers use, he suggested this story to Pete Coe. It's from the Wall Street Journal. A wild turkey apparently is attacking people in Washington, D.C., and multiple agencies are in pursuit. I'm very excited to see what Pete has come up with. Rampaging D.C. turkey showing his fluffy rump. Pedestrians flee in terror on today's news dump. <laughs> Rampaging D.C. turkey. Showing its rump. Well done, sir. Thanks, Benny, for the idea. Send your suggestions to Pete and I anytime you want. Pete's on Twitter at PeteCoVO. All right. Well, here's a good story about a woman. Her name is Kelsey Whitmore. And last night, she took the field as the first woman to ever start a Atlantic League baseball game in history. She started in left field. And then, by the way, she got hit by a pitch and took her base. But the Cal State Fullerton softball alumni joined the team in April and now has had her first start is behind her. And she doesn't plan to stop there. She says she wants to make it to the big leagues. I love it. Go do yourself a favor and watch video of her taking the field. Germany and India has signed a $10.5 billion green development deal. Germany and India have signed a series of bilateral agreements that will see the South Asian nation receive 10 billion euros in aid by 2030 to boost the use of clean energy. That's a huge story, and I want to understand what the implications for that are. Tennessee Governor Bill Lee is pausing executions in his state, which still has them because it's primitive and medieval, I'm sorry, for the rest of the year after the state failed to ensure that its lethal injection drugs were properly tested. So that's good news. We'll see what happens, and hopefully they don't bring it back. I think they will. A Kansas tornado generated winds of 165 miles an hour, destroyed homes, damaged more than 1,000 buildings, created a path of destruction nearly 13 miles long. Four people, including two firefighters responding to a call, were injured during the storm, but their injuries were minor, apparently. Although I did read somebody, uh, several people died in t- these tornadoes. I think these same tornadoes. So I'm not quite sure. Look into that. Terrible. Absolutely. Uh, those videos. Have you seen the videos of the tornadoes? Absolutely terrifying. Power. Okay, moving on. This is good news coming out of Oklahoma. How about that? A judge is letting Tulsa race massacre reparations lawsuit proceed. An Oklahoma judge has ruled that a lawsuit can proceed that seeks reparations for survivors and descendants of victims of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Very interesting and important story to mention. Several headlines on the war in Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Evacuees from Maripol and its besieged steel plant made their way towards safety. Evacuation of 100 civilians from the plant has begun. Ukrainian officials said a rocket strike hit the port city of Odessa, southwestern Ukraine, killing a child. European Union energy ministers met in Brussels to discuss options for dealing with Russia's decision last week to stop delivering natural gas to Poland and Bulgaria. Israel is now demanding an apology from Russia for comments its foreign minister made about Nazism. Their foreign minister referred to Adolf Hitler as having, quote, Jewish origins. And First Lady Jill Biden will travel to Slovakia and Romania later this week to meet with Ukrainian refugees, aid workers and teachers who are educating displaced Ukrainian children and U.S. military personnel stationed in Romania. And your good news tonight, couldn't get Ava out in the shed. It is hard to do. She's studying for a test. Texas scientists, I'll do it. Texas scientists have created a protein that breaks down plastic bottles. It's called a Pac-Man, Pac-Man protein that gobbles up plastic and breaks it down. Could open the door to eliminating billions of tons of landfill waste. And I am going to look into that and talk to some experts, of course, about that. 
such an important issue, and uh, I want to learn more. All right. Well, that's it. That's the news, folks. Now it's time to get to my guest, Dr. Dana Suskind, coming up, the author of this amazing book and part of this amazing movement it's called Parent Nation, Unlocking Every Child's Potential, Fulfilling Society's Promise. Dr. Dana Suskind will join me, but first, it's time for uh, my monthly conversation with anti-racist writer and speaker and activist and amazing on Twitter at Tim Jacob Wise. Read and subscribe and support him at Medium, timjwise.medium.com. And of course, get all of his books. Most recently, Dispatches from the Race War. Here we go. Right now. We just talked for 20 minutes off the record where you gave me great advice and just want to say thank you on the record. You have always been such a really good friend and mentor to me, and I really appreciate it. It means everything to me. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. So let's talk about your latest work and what's happening in the world right now. First of all, you have a post from early April that I wanted to kind of unpack. Uh, Racism made COVID worse. Scholars just proved it. There's all kinds of data that gets documented from different federal agencies and obviously academics as well. What are we talking about here? What's the data? Well, you know, this argument that I had made several times in previous posts and usually was making it with a collection of sort of circumstantial evidence and analysis, which I think was strong enough, you know, to to make the case. The argument had been essentially that, you know, once the uh, reports were out in April, of 2020, that the disproportionate mortality rates were happening in black communities. That's when we started to see a lot of white America, particularly in quote unquote red states, take their foot off the brake, take off the masks that they've been wearing for like two weeks, start yelling about social distancing at the Trader Joe's being the next stop to Auschwitz or whatever. You know, that was when all that started, when they started showing up at the state houses with the guns. And I didn't think the timing was coincidental. Tom Hartman, the radio host, had made that point in a piece that he wrote around that time, you know, that as soon as it was known, it's black people doing the dispro dying. Oh, well, then we don't have anything to worry about. And of course, you know, the irony was six, eight months later, right? The white numbers were through the roof as well. And the areas that Trump carried by 20 points were the hardest hit. Well, now uh, the the recent piece that you referenced, I, I have a link in there to a recent academic study where some researchers actually sat down with two or three different groups of of white folks and presented them with information about the disproportionate uh, both infection rates, hospitalization, mortality rates, and found that in this sort of controlled experimental setting, same thing happens, right? When people are made aware or when they are aware of the disproportionate effect on black folks, there is a marked reduction in their concern, in their support for masking, their desire to get a vaccination, their support for various social distancing. And it's not, you know, it's not necessarily because they are completely indifferent to Black death. I'm not saying that these are horrible, awful, mean, bigoted people. But what it suggests is that when you think the pain is over there, even if you're not a particularly horrible person. And some of the folks in these surveys, interestingly, expressed otherwise sort of liberal or progressive views. They like pre-screen them and ask them other questions or whatever. Um, These are not all like reactionary, horrible people. You know, these are a a cross-section of folks, but there tends to be a definite reduction in the overt concern and a nonchalance that creeps in that ironically, of course, leaves those individuals at greater risk. Because if you're thinking still after all this time, that, oh, well, if it's the cities that are being hit, it's not going to affect me. Uh, That's going to, you know, directly correlate with your unwillingness to take the steps that you need to take, whether it's vaccines or masks or whatever it is, uh, to stay safe. And that's why right now uh, in this country as a whole, two years after this began, about 63 percent of the folks who have died now are white, which is roughly proportional with the white population. Um, so those numbers have caught up yeah. to white folks now, and I don't think it's a coincidence. By the way, I don't want to give the impression that the black and brown folks of this country are not still disproportionately affected. They are. When you adjust the death rates for age, there's still huge disproportionality. One of the reasons the white numbers are as high as they are is there are more white old folks in America than there are black and brown folks. So that's part of it. But still, a lot of folks bury in grandma, right? A lot of folks bury in grandma and older parents because they decided, well, this isn't going to hit Sioux yeah. City. 
you know, or this isn't going to hit, you know, Lincoln, Nebraska, or this isn't going to hit wherever Bozeman, Montana. And of course it does. Uh, yeah. You're so right. I, you're right. Got academic proof. You're right in the piece. Indeed, the real lesson of COVID is that ignoring racial disparities will ultimately come back to haunt white people, too. What begins as a problem for black and brown does not remain localized for long. And I would only add that. That we it's probably human to have indifference about things that don't necessarily directly affect us. I think one issue I've always thought that about is the health insurance industry. Most people have health insurance and most people's health insurance is actually decent. And so they're not that worried about the issue until they don't have health insurance. And, you know, there's many other issues where people are just kind of indifferent about and therefore, you know, they look uncaring, but eventually it affects you is think is, is what you're saying. Oh, yeah, here. This is not, this is definitely not something I'm trying to say white people uniquely do this. Like this is a very human thing, Yeah. but, but the thing is, if you have that human tendency in a society of profound racial and let's say economic uh, inequality, right. The, the people who we have been taught to be indifferent about in particular and to have less concern for, happen to look a certain way, happen to live in a particular part of town disproportionately, happen to have a certain amount of money or not a certain amount of money in the bank. And so these these kinds of human tendencies end up recreating and reproducing and reinforcing racial inequity, gender inequity, class inequity. And then the irony is it does come back to bite you on the ass. This is and the point I'm really trying to make again is, you know, in the midst of this silly season where everybody's attacking critical race theory, one of the prime insights of critical race theory is the importance of interest convergence of white people understanding that their interests actually dovetail with the interest of black and brown people. What more evidence do you need than all these dead grandmas, right? What more evidence do you need than what we've got from COVID? If you need more, we have the opioid epidemic, which is a direct result of fighting a war on drugs, which really was a war on black people. So we didn't do rehab and treatment. We did prison. What is deindustrialization? That starts in the 80s and black communities and the Rust Belt and Michigan and Pennsylvania and elsewhere. And, you know, white folks were like, well, if there are no jobs in the city, get up and move and pull yourself up. And now all those white communities are losing jobs and they're demanding that politicians find jobs or bring the jobs back to my little town. Well, maybe you should have had some empathy for these other folks and that great wouldn't point. have happened. The great, you know, there's, great. Um, there's yep. a ton of examples. Uh, you know, Jonathan Metzl talks about a bunch of them in his book, Dying of Whiteness, gun violence, you know, folks that are going and buying all these weapons to protect themselves from home intruders who they view as black and brown because they've been sold a racist bill of goods. And then what happens is you don't actually use the guns for that, but you end up in a moment of emotional distress killing yourself. And so you have suicide rates in white communities going through the roof. 83% of all suicide, gun suicides in the United States are uh, committed by white men, just white men, not even including white women, according to the, the data. So these are people that thought guns would protect them, and then in their own moments of despondency, you know, I mean, people commit suicide other ways. When you have a gun, it's a hell of a lot yep, easier. Yep, yep. And, that's, and <clears throat> the ability to change your mind is a hell of a lot less. And so we've got all this evidence that all of this racist thinking and racist policy and racist nonchalance about pain in other people's communities comes back to haunt. And we still just keep ignoring it. It's unbelievable. Uh, let's talk about another piece of yours that we just kind of led into, which is five big lies about critical race theory. Conservatives attacking anti-racist education are deceiving you. You know, I read this and I'm trying to take notes on how to uh, talk to you about it, but it's so well written and, and as everything, you know, nuanced, you know, just give me whatever ones you want to pick. Cause I, I, I certainly want to move on and, and talk about, we talked a lot about CRT here. But they've moved sure. on to some extent from CRT to all the teachers, especially the men in school, are groomers. And you've written about that. But let's start with the, yeah. the lies. What do you want to give me on this? Well, you know, I mean, just I'll just tell you real briefly what they are and then encourage people to go read the piece. I mean, the, if you read the legislation that has been passed in 15 states now, I think, yeah. last count, um, uh, attacking so-called critical race theory, the arguments being made, because sometimes the law doesn't say CRT, it doesn't use the phrasing. Uh, but they say, well, you know, we don't want anything uh, in schools that suggest that people are, you know, um, uh, inherently racist or inherently privileged or inherently oppressors or inherently victims or that people should feel shame or guilt for the actions of their ancestors or that the idea of merit is an inherently racist argument. None of these things are actually part of critical race theory. None of these things are what those of us in the anti-racist movement talk about. But by phrasing them that way, they're attempting to frame anti-racism as a whole 
as this thing that is inherently anti-white, that's about judging white people. And I go through all of these in the piece to sort of explain why they are inaccurate. That in fact, we are not arguing that white people are inherently racist. First of all, the whole point of CRT is that there is no such thing as race as an organic real entity, right? It's a made up social category that was created to justify and rationalize inequality. So if it's not even real, it can't, nothing about it can be inherent, right? White people can't be inherently anything if, if, if race doesn't even have meaning other than what we have right. put on it. So I go through an explanation of why these are all distortions of what we're saying. No one is inherently privileged. Privilege comes from social structures. Critical race theory isn't about judging white people as people. It's about judging whiteness as a system of social organization. It is, in fact, most of the CRT scholars and me and other anti-racist scholars for years have said that whiteness actually hurts people called white, that it actually distorts us as well, that it damages us. So the idea that the analysis is anti-white or trying to make people feel guilty, we're not trying to make people feel guilty, we're trying to save people, including white people, from the harms of a system of inequality. And so I just sort of go through the list and there's a couple other things in there, but, but the idea is that all of the legislation is essentially predicated on a red herring, a false uh, and a very deliberately false interpretation of what is being said. Because if you really read any of the CRT material, any of my material, any anti-racist scholars material, Kendi's material and others, you will see that none of the things that are being alleged are part of it. Now, can you find some rando on Twitter or a Reddit thread who says something like, all white people are evil devils, I wish they'd all die? Well, of course. I mean, I can find I can find all kinds of crazy shit on the Internet. Somebody saying something on a YouTube video that says white people are cave dwelling. You know what? Of course, yeah, that's I mean, actually the name of my college orientation talk, but neither here nor there. Right. I mean, you can find that stuff, <laughs> but that's not a CRT scholar. Some, some dude, some right. dude on Reddit or Twitter telling you, you know, or the guys that are screaming on the corner, you know, the the, the black Hebrew Israelites that are screaming on the corner yeah, in right. New York City at white people talking about killing cracker babies, they are not CRT scholars. You know, heads up, these these are not anti-racist. No, they're uh, dressed uh, as the educators. They're dressed as the intercontinental champion of WWE. That's one way that you know that they're not scholars. You know, it's it's well, everything that you just said is so important and people should read the piece to see all the lies. But do you know, Tim, if these laws, these anti CRT laws that they've passed, how many states did you say now? Like fifteen states? Do they really what effect? I, I want to believe that they don't have a really negative effect because we're not teaching CRT. So what are they stopping? They're just making it's just a campaign thing. It's a raise money to scare people. What well, effect? Well, see, this is the thing. So the right will argue, well, if this isn't what you're doing, what are you scared of? Right. That's their argument. If you're not doing these things, then don't worry about it. But here's the problem. What these laws do in most cases, I don't think this is true in all, but in Florida and several others, they've created these private causes of action where parents can sue a school, a teacher by name, right. or they can sue the school district or the school itself um, if they believe that these things are being done. And even though they probably wouldn't be able to prove that in court, if I'm a teacher, this is like the equivalent of what Texas is doing with abortion, right? The idea is let's create civil causes of action so that people can bring a lawsuit against you. And you'll be so afraid of having to defend against it, even though you might win, You'll be so afraid of having to defend against it that you'll just decide, you know what, screw it. I'm not even going to talk about race at all. I don't want to take a chance. I'm not going to have any DEI stuff, no training for teachers because I don't want to get sued. This is the right. And, and, and there's a lot of other stuff going on. I mean, these are people that want to discredit public education anyway. Yeah. Chris Rufo, who started this with the Manhattan Institute, has said that, that, that you really need to discredit public education by creating doubt about what is happening in public education because they want universal vouchers for their private you know schools and particularly religious institutions and so th there's no question that's what they're trying to do is to sow this this doubt about what's happening but it's all premised on the idea that if we can if we can threaten to sue you or in some states to take your license to to fire you they're actually in New Hampshire they were they were uh, proposing moms for liberty this right wing group was proposing $500 bounties for any parent who could find a teacher doing this stuff in the classroom, right? So this is the kind of vigilante 
justice that they believe in. And the idea is just to shut it down so that teachers are too yep. afraid to do their job. And there are teachers where th this is happening. I've talked to teachers who say, I'm too afraid to even just talk about the civil rights movement. I'm, I'm afraid to talk about anything that touches on race at all. There are, you know, we've talked about this before, racial incident after racial incident after racial incident at campuses around the country and teachers and administrators don't know how to deal with it. Because if you talk about, let's say, racist bullying, but you actually call out the racism, somebody's going to accuse you of doing CRT, right? They're going to, well, you're talking about racism, yeah. that's CRT. There are some states where, I think it was Alabama, where the secretary of a state or somebody, maybe is the attorney general, who's a Republican, had to explain to parents, no, Black History Month is not CRT. Settle down. Like they actually had to explain that. Right. So you've got folks that are being intimidated, already taking things out of the curriculum, which is also, of course, and I know this is what you want to lead into happening with regard to LGBTQ issues yeah. in Florida and elsewhere where teachers are removing rainbow flags because they're afraid of being sued for, for that. They're removing any kind of materials that might suggest that they are supportive of LGBTQ folks and their it's crazy. equality. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, by the way, I mean, you know, at our board meetings, it's uh, get, you know, get rid of CRT. And oh, by the way, DEI is just code for CRT. And basically, there's so little nuance because there's not, nothing to it, to their arguments. There's not even a grain really of truth to it that they they water them down to convincing sound bites which are acronyms so black history month is bhm which is just another way to say crt and everybody's outraged you're like wait no it's just black history oh we've lost the narrative they they've nailed us again with another scary scary acronym but yeah and then of course lgbtqi you can add to it you've written about this two brilliant pieces at timjwise.medium.com. And sadly, this is the next page in the play grew up, uh, playbook of Rufo. He's been outspoken about it. Accusing yeah. teachers of sexual abuse will harm students is the title of, of your first piece. Uh, you say teachers are often the best support system kids have. Attacking them puts them puts that at risk. That at risk. You don't have to be a QAnon cultist to agree that child sexual abuse is a serious problem worthy of attention. But as you say, I mean, there's a lot more details to this, but this is crazy. And I'm watching it happen even in my school, Tim, across the country as well. What's next? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, you know, this is all very much about trying. I mean, both the race stuff and the, the, the anti LGBTQ stuff is about at its root, it's about trying to turn the clock back on the last 50 or 60 years of American progress, however uneven and incomplete that has been. These are people who want to erase the last half of the 20th century, mm -hmm. whether we're talking about the gains for black and brown folks, the gains for women as women, uh, and certainly the gains for LGBTQ folks. These these are people for whom, and we've, we've used the analogy or the or the the this phraseology before, you know, that when you have had hegemony, pluralism feels like oppression to you, right? So when you've, when you've sort of been able to take for granted that the pie is all yours or very nearly all yours, when you actually have to share it even a little bit, not, not, not lose it all together, not give it all up, not have somebody else take it from you, but simply share it, uh, it feels like the world's coming to an end because you're so used to having it all. And so if you're, if you're white, if you're Christian, if you're straight, and cisgendered, if you're a man, and all of a sudden in the last 50 years, your prerogatives as a white person to not have to compete with those people are now gone because we have civil rights and your kids have to compete with them for college. So sorry. And if you're a man and your prerogatives have been diminished because actually now women can hold whatever jobs do and you just have to sort of deal with that. Um, or if you're straight and cisgendered or Christian and all of a sudden there's religious pluralism and we're talking about LGBTQ folks as actual human beings who get to live their lives on their terms without having to stay in, in the closet that you put them in uh, because of your own bigotries. All of that feels like, oh, we're losing something. Right. And so there's a, and we know from a lot of political science research finds that people will organize much more readily to protect against loss than they will to obtain new things. This is something progressives never understand because people on the left will say, well, the way we appeal to these people is just say, if they would come together, we'd get better health care and we'd get better benefits and wages would go up. People don't know from that because that's something you're saying, this is aspirational. If we do X, we can get yes. Y. And what the right is saying, you've already got X, but if you're not careful, Y is going to take it from you. 
And that is a much more powerful psychological message, which the left has never, ever understood. And so we keep looking back at the New Deal and we say, oh, but it worked, you know, 90 years ago. At one time, literally, that it worked in American history. And we go, oh, well, surely it'll work again. We don't understand the psychology behind any of this, but the right does, which is why they're calling people groomers and pedophiles. And they're framing their legislation, like in Florida, you know, the don't say gay bill. They'll, they, when, when you call it that, they'll say, well, it doesn't say that. The word gay is not even in there. Neither is the word transgender. You're exaggerating the problem. But but read the legislation. What it says is that there can be no instruction on, or if you read the preamble, discussion about um, sexual orientation or gender identity. Yes, it doesn't say gay, it doesn't say trans, it doesn't say LGBTQ. So they would argue, you're just not supposed to talk about it at all. But what does that mean? First of all, does that mean that if I am a teacher in the classroom and I'm straight and married, that I need to take off my wedding ring because a kid might ask me, oh, are you married, Mr. Wise? You know, uh, tell me about your wife. And I and then now I'm introducing sexual orientation and I'm discussing that. Do I, can I bring my can I bring my spouse to the to the PTA meeting or to the event at school? Can I have a picture of my spouse on the desk? Well, if, what if what if the teacher's gay? Can they do that? You know, it, do we have books in the library that happen to show two two dads or two moms or, you know, a, a blended family that have gay or or, or a, a trans folk in the family? Uh, if we're drawing pictures in class, you know, can I can I put can I can I say this is the dad? This is the mom, because that's now introducing both gender identity and sexual orientation potentially. And of course, they would never say that there's anything wrong with that. They would never say that if a kid comes in talking about, oh, I love the movie Tangled, that the teacher has to shut it down because those are straight people, you know, or, or Sleeping Beauty. But God forbid you have a book or artwork that depicts someone who's LGBTQ. That's what they're trying to get rid of. So yep. they're couching it. They know that's how it's going to be enforced. They know that it's not going to be enforced to shut down heteronormativity. You didn't hear anybody on the Florida legislative floor saying that they were concerned about children being recruited to a heterosexual lifestyle by, by their teacher's picture of their opposite sex spouse on the desk. They didn't have people saying, you know, I'm a little concerned that the teacher might convince little Susie, who presents as a female, that she's actually also female gender. Like, no one's worried about that. They're only worried about the LGBTQ folk somehow converting. Yeah. Well, the standing they trope. They're going to convert our yes, because, you know, kids regularly and, you know, this is a parent. Children regularly adopt identities that are going to get them beaten, ostracized and thrown out of their home just for shits and giggles. Like that's what kids do. Kids love being ostracized, being attacked, being disowned by their families, being told that they're going to hell, being sent to conversion camp. They do that just to be cool. I'm sure you would agree that that's well, been your experience. I mean, okay. it's well, my older brother is, as you know, the the reason, you know, Brian, he turned me on to you what 20 years ago, your work. Uh, and he was always a nonconformist, you know, like he never fit in and they beat right. him. And they ridiculed him and they marginalized him. And it, the, the reason I've always respected him is because he just he didn't want to follow the, the, the group. He didn't want to be like everybody else. He couldn't in good conscience be like everybody else. And for that, they ridiculed him. And that's, you know, it's it was always his principle. And it's always so great how creative he was. And, and yeah, you, the kids like that often get marginalized. But the, the danger you're talking about this this. This ghost, these manufactured threats, when in actuality we know, and you have all the research at your fingertips and you include it, we know exactly where child sex abuse comes from. And we know exactly who is supportive and helpful. And you write teachers are so often a source of support for kids experiencing trauma at home. And most of the time, or at least half the time, the trauma is coming from home, someone in their home. And you write about this and you say the most important thing here, Tim, is this is why it's so dangerous. Demonizing teachers and making them afraid to discuss anything related to sexuality with students and even students who raise the issue as if they might be or were being abused. It would remove critical support systems that these kids need and access every single day in their schools. Yeah. And the thing that really concerns me, uh, you know, is we know who's going to be most um, targeted. It's going to be male teachers. Yes. And the reason it's going to be is because whenever we're talking about pedophilia and grooming, that's what people are thinking about. Right. Which is sort of ironic when you think about it, because it seems like every time I hear a case about a teacher 
involved sexually with a kid. It's a white woman, usually, you know, with with somebody in high school. Now, that's not appropriate either. Uh, but 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 it's just interesting to me that that's that's what we actually hear about. Right. It's not actually the it's certainly not the gay uh, uh, third grade male teacher who's acting out with his kids. It's usually the high school you know, uh, chemistry uh, teacher who's, you know, started some completely inappropriate sexual and emotional relationship with a 16 year old, which is completely wrong, completely illegal, morally ridiculous. But it's just funny. We still go after gay men. They're, they're the problem. They're the, the predators. And so in this particular case, we already have, I think, not nearly enough men teaching. And I'm not saying that like as some, you know, <laughs> man's rights kind of, this is not a Joe Rogan-y kind of statement that I'm making here. What I'm saying is we know from, from the research that it's really valuable to have men in positions like teachers and not only like as the gym coach or yeah. the football coach or, you know, the gym teacher, the football coach who also doubles as the health teacher for some weird reason. <laughs> uh, you know, it's always the health it teacher, is. right? Like, it and is. the coach is never the model of health, at least not <laughs> in my high school. Like he was overweight, for you know, sure. in horrible shape, but he's the health teacher and the coach. And, you know, but I mean, it's important to have guys in elementary school classes and middle school classes and not necessarily for the reason some might say it's not oh boys need role models per se that that research is not so clear but we do know that having men in those kind of positions because teaching involves a combination of authority and nurturing right you're both an authority figure who you know can bring down the hammer so to speak and and there's discipline involved and you know and certain amount of control involved but it's a it's a nurturing kind of of discipline if done correctly it's a nurturing kind of control and authority and men are often not in positions where they get to blend those you know uh, and and those of us who are trying to be better men better fathers and all that it's important to have support of people who are doing that kind of work. If all the men are doing the jobs where like their word is law and they don't have to show any emotion and they yeah. don't have to sit with you and talk with you, then it reinforces gender stereotypes that are not only bad for women, they're also bad for men Absolutely. and boys need to see that. And I am deathly afraid that this is going to cause a lot of men who are not grooming anyone. They're not doing anything inappropriate in these schools, but they're going to think like, especially if they are gay, Right. If, if they are actually, let's say, a gay male who's a teacher and not doing anything inappropriate, but it's like, holy shit, if they know that I'm gay or if they find out that I'm gay, they're going to come for me. Yeah. So screw it. I'm going to find another career. That would be a horrible loss well, to, to education as a vocation. It'd be a horrible loss to kids. To be clear, if you talk to people in education, teachers and, and principals, it, it already is. People are leaving. Yeah. They're leaving yeah. the profession uh, and, and because of this, these kinds of techniques, because of what you're saying, like it's already certainly happening. Um, lastly, your your essay, you know, which leads into this conversation is we need to talk about America's real groomer problem. And it's just there's been so much research and so many really important books are written about this. And unfortunately, we can document it all day long. And you have so well in this piece, evangelical Christians regularly push their beliefs and lifestyle and others. It's not OK. And we shouldn't be afraid to say so. How dare you? How dare you, Tim Wise? Yeah. You know, I, I did this because, as, as I'm sure you did, you saw that video that was bopping around a week or so ago, two weeks ago of the evangelical group on the plane. Yeah. That thought, you know, 30,000 feet is a really good place to worship the Lord publicly, like not privately because, oh, the plane might crash and I want to be ready, you know, but no, I think you who don't even know me and are not with my group need to hear me sing about Jesus. And it infuriated me. Uh, and it, I think a lot of people were upset about it. And, and then there were other people that were like, well, what's the big deal? I mean, well, first of all, uh, seatbelt sign, sit the hell down. Like, like, why are you up with a guitar, you know, doing do I mean, you're you're well, hold you're on. Just, we should doing, we should just we should be clear. It's never, almost never OK to yeah. stand up with your guitar, no. e even if you're <laughs> if you're the fucking edge. I don't care right. if you're Stevie Ray Vaughan. I don't I'm not here for your guitar. Music. OK, right. maybe maybe some guitars, but it's almost never OK to stand up with a guitar and start singing anything, even if it's my favorite song, much less your religious song. 
Right, right. I don't want to hear it at 30,000 feet. I want you to sit down. I don't want you to be distracting the professionals from the job that they got to do because they either feel the feel the spirit of the Lord or they're just trying to. I don't. I just want I want us to just or maybe I just want to sleep like like, you know, maybe I didn't get on here to what, hear about. Why are you performing, but, sir? I'm sleeping. Right. Why are you performing anything? Right. And this and this performative. um Christianity, because really that's what it is. Look, Matthew, the book of Matthew is very clear. I'm no biblical scholar, but it's right there that, you know, God is very clear that that he wants folks to pray in their closet, because when you pray in public, when you show yourself to, to demonstrate your piety in public, you're doing that because you're a hypocrite. You want people to see you and think what a great person you are, rather than just go in the closet where it's only between you and God. So when people do this, it always makes me upset, but particularly as someone who isn't a Christian, and I know a lot of Christians that were horribly offended too. So don't get me wrong. A lot of folks weighed in on Twitter and elsewhere and were like, this is not what our religion is about. This is not what we ought to be doing. The point I was trying to make is this isn't rare. I then have another video embedded in the piece from a different flight, same week of a guy who like just dispensed with the guitar. He's like, screw accompaniment. We yeah. don't need that. Yeah. I'm just going to give it to you raw. This is bareback <laughs> grooming, clearly. Um, and he just decided he's going to stand up and just just say, like, I'm going to do an altar call. Y'all yeah. want communion, but you just want to give your life to Jesus why not? You know, like I hate to interrupt your sleep or your work or whatever the hell you're doing or your drink that you're having. But just I need to do this because God told me and and, it, and he stands up. And the first thing he says is, if you were to die today, would you be right? OK, stop. We're we're in an airplane. People are already. Afraid please of don't that. say now- please don't talk about death during a time no. where I'm thinking about. It, the whole time I'm on, you know how many drugs I'm on right now to not think right. about this plane crashing? And now you're going to stand up and talk about right. that? It makes me uneasy. By the way, it's not unrealistic. I mean, I've been involved in, in, in oh, situations, yeah. altercations on planes. There's no, there's, this is a no-nonsense place. Nobody gets right. to, and since 9-11. Somebody, and here's my thing. If you're somebody that that, that is cool with dying because you're ready to go and meet Jesus, yep. I don't need you talking about this because it scares the shit out. I was on a plane once coming out of Denver and we couldn't get height for some the hydraulics were messed up we're headed toward the mountains this is a bit of a problem and uh we sort of turned and went parallel to the mountains and everybody else was asleep except for me and like a 90 year old woman sitting next to me and i'm looking out and i'm noticing like we're not gaining any altitude and i'm starting to get a little nervous they come on they're like well the hydraulic system went out we can't get any altitude we're gonna have to make a crash landing i'm a little freaked out and the woman's like are you afraid to die, honey? I'm like, I'm not afraid. I just didn't want to today. And if I were 90, I might be a little more sanguine. You know, like if, if like if we were peers just coming from our high school reunion, I might be right there with you. I'm not saying this to her, but this is what I'm thinking. And I'm like, <laughs> of course, you're not afraid to die. Of course, you're not because you died like a decade ago. You of know? course you're not afraid to die. You wake up every morning and go, yes. Right. Every day is such a blessing. And it's like at the time I was maybe 29. I'm like, Jesus. Dude, dude, you know, listen, I- here's the rule. Post 9-11, and I'm not joking. Post 9-11, if you get up on the plane and start talking, I'm taking you down. I don't know. Yeah. You have there's no there's right. no reason unless you're de-escalating something. To sit down. Right. I don't care what you're selling. I don't want your message. You're a fucking right. psycho. Everybody knows this. It's good etiquette. Don't stand up and start talking on a plane because we will take you out. We will take you right. out. And I'll- if you stand up with a guitar, I'm taking it and doing Jimi Hendrix at Monterey. Like I'm I think smashing. that's fine. I, I know. think that's. And, and so long story short, th- that got me started on this piece because my whole life, and I've written about this, talked about this many times. Um, you know, I growing up in Nashville as a pretty secular Jew, but, but, you know, in terms of parentage and background, Jewish going to Hebrew school until I was old enough to drop out. Um, I, uh, I was subjected to in Nashville, very Gentile place. I mean, there are about 5,000 Jews that are, that are open about it uh, here at the time. (laughs) And I mean, the numbers are higher now, but at the time it's about 5,000 of us. And, um, you know, regularly had, had teachers, principals, um, openly encouraging evangelical Christians in our schools. I mean, at one point, my, my middle school principal um, had us, we used to call it junior high school in those days. Now we call it middle school, but had us all sort of shepherded into the auditorium for a Young Life meeting. And for those who don't know, Young yeah. Life is oh, you know, yeah. probably the largest Christian youth 
organization, or at least was at the time in the United States. And, and I'm thinking, wait, this is a mandatory. This wasn't like, hey, if you want to go, which even that during the school day, I don't think should be happening. But but there was no opt out. There was nothing. It was just you're going. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching this kid testify about the Lord. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to have to do this because I was that 12 year old, you know. So so basically I stood up. I looked at the few other Jewish kids. I'm like, what is going on? They were like, eh. I'm like, well, I guess it's up to me because I've always been that troublemaker because my parents encouraged it. Yeah. And I said, fuck it. And I got up and I walked out and the principal, you know, cornered me in the hall. And he's like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to call my lawyer. And he, and he, you know, cause I was, I was that guy. And he's like, you don't have a lawyer. You're 12. And I'm like, yeah, but I got the ACLU number memorized and my parents will, you know, you can't, and I'm going off on him. And, uh, and he apologized because he it got Good. nervous and, Good. and, and, wow. and, and that was just one example. But, but I mean, I had the same in high school, I had a teacher who would quote the Bible to us in class. He would put anti-abortion literature on our tables that had like scriptural quotes in them. I had teachers that would, when religion came up, that would say, that would tell me that I was going to hell. And so I just feel like what we have missed is that grooming. We think of grooming and it's been framed as the sexual thing. Yeah. That's the dominant way in which we understand it. But if, if we understand grooming as the psychological and emotional manipulation of young people to get them to do or be something that they wouldn't otherwise do or be, which is what they're saying about, you know, teachers. Well, they're pedophiles or they're trying to groom kids to be gay or whatever, to take them away from who they are and make them something else. Well, what is that if not what evangelical Christians are trying to do, whether it's with their own kids dragging their their five year old to Sunday school and filling their head with stories of hell and, and basically telling their kids from an early age, long before their kids can figure any of this out on their own. You know, your friend that isn't that doesn't think the way we do. Yeah, they're going to burn in a lake of fire forever. Have a nice day. Yep. We'll go to brunch <laughs> after church. You know, like that, <laughs> that's that scares the shit out of children. And then they try to do it to other people's children. And I just think it's time that we acknowledge. I, and, and I know this is not every evangelical, certainly not every Christian. My wife is a Christian. My my mom is a Christian. My very best friend in the world is a Christian. Um, and. And they're not like that at all. And I know evangelicals. I mentioned Jim Wallace in the piece, you know, a fantastic uh, role model for for human beings, let alone for evangelical Christians. A lot of listeners to the show are Christian. I love them. Yeah. Yeah. This is not inherent to being a Christian. And it's not even necessarily inherent to being an evangelical. But there is this strain of evangelicalism that is rooted not in demonstrating a Christ-like example by the way you live, which I would argue is is the only kind of evangelizing that Jesus actually seemed to care much about was 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 living by a certain example. Or you can decide to evangelize based on threat and based on cajoling and based on saying, if you don't say these magic words, you're going to burn forever. And when you do that to a child, you are grooming them. And I think if that's what they're going to say about us and those of us on this side of the issues, and they're going to call us all pedophiles, they're going to yep. call us all sexual yep. groomers, they're going to call us all anti-white bigots, that it's time that we actually point out that the, the the deepest psychological, emotional, and mental manipulation and abuse that's happening in this country is happening at the hands of the very people who are trying to put it on us. Everything they do is projection. Everything. They yep. are a psychological projection cult. They are sort of a, a, a textbook example of what projection is in every single one of these things that they do, whether it's voter fraud. They're the ones who are who are casting ballots for their dead mother. Oh, I did it. I'm sorry. Okay, but that's against the law. And that's the thing you say that these people are doing, but you're doing it right. And, and you know, not to mention, even when we are talking about sexual abuse, how many times do we open the paper and the latest you know, child sexual scandal? It's the youth pastor yeah. who's doing that, too. Right. It's the it's the guy at the religious camp. Who's doing that? Or it's the priest in the Catholic Church who's doing that. like like it's it's the people whose sexual sexual lives are so incredibly repressed, right, that they then end up acting out on the basis of all of these things that they've never been able to healthfully process because their religion tells them it's dirty to think about sex. So they 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 suppress it and then it shows up in all these incredibly dysfunctional ways. So even when it comes to old school grooming, like they're not exactly the ones to be pointing fingers at people and, right? and, but and let alone the, the grooming they do every day which is what they're pushing their faith i think is all right that was my conversation with the great tim wise i am sorry for the abrupt ending we had a little technical issue and it's boring to explain but it has to do with bluetooth okay 
And anyway, my mic cut out and it just, it was annoying. We were almost wrapped up. Tim Wise, always a pleasure. At Tim Jacob Wise on Twitter. His medium is timjwise.medium.com. I highly recommend you read all his stuff in context right there on the page. So great to read and I always love his writing. timjwise.medium.com. Get all of his books, of course, too. And tell him that you heard him here on the show. All right, well. Now I'm very excited to bring to you a first-timer here on Stand Up. She came highly recommended from former, longtime Chicago Tribune columnist and friend of mine, Heidi Stevens, who is just an amazing and brilliant woman who we talk a little bit about. But my guest is the founder and co-director of the TMW Center for Early Learning and Public Health. She's also the director of the pediatric cochlear, cochlear, See what I did? Implantation program and professor of surgery and pediatrics at University of Chicago. She's the author of more than 45 scientific publications and a book bestseller, 30 Million Words, Building a Child's Brain. She's a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics, a fellow for the Early Childhood Advisory Council. And she's been seen on NPR and New York Times, The Economist, and so much more. I'm so happy to have at Dr. DR Dana Suskind on Twitter, parentnation.org. The new book, Parent Nation Unlocking Every Child's Potential, Fulfilling Society's Promise. A wonderful, brilliant, amazing, down to earth, passionate, articulate, powerful, and open and vulnerable. I just can't think of, I can't say enough positive adjectives about Dr. Dana Suskind. But I will say there was something wrong with maybe her internet connection. I'll blame hers. There are a couple blips out, uh, it, it's in the latter half. I hope it's tolerable. I thought it was. I don't think we missed too much, but I I know that can get annoying. But she had a great mic, so I want to leave the audio the way it was. Okay, here we go. A world-renowned doctor and surgeon, of course, but almost more importantly now, her work and I guess social science and public policy, parent nation unlocking every child's potential, fulfilling society's promise. Congratulations, Dana, on the book and, and the movement that you started with it. And thank you so much for joining me on the show. I'm so happy to have you here. So excited to be here. So let's just talk about how you got into this. I guess I wanted to get the hard part out of the way the way first. You lost your husband uh, while he was trying to save children's lives in a heroic uh, effort and terrible accident. And he died. And... As a re- I mean, not as a result, but it, it, I think it helped you understand a kind of suffering that so many other families had to go through that maybe you hadn't before. Is that f- an interesting place to start? Yeah, you you're going straight for it, Pete. Um, I want to get it out yeah, of the way. No. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I usually talk with my about my work as a surgeon and how it got me into the science. But but the truth of the matter is the. My personal story of losing my husband uh, back in 2012, uh, he was saving, he was an amazing guy, first of all. Uh, he was saving two children from Lake Michigan and he lost his life. And it left me widowed with uh, three young children. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, my world is crumbling. What am I going to do? Are, you know, most importantly, are my kids going to be OK? Um, it was it was uh, really overwhelming, as you might imagine. But I always say, you know, at that moment, I lost my faith in serendipity. Um, I'd always sort of been lucky, um, but I found my faith in humanity because my community, my employer, my world really just rallied around us. Um, propped us up and got us through the days, months, years um, until we got back on our feet. And so in some ways, this book is about the science and why we need to invest in parents and caregivers from day one through the lens of of the child child's development. But as much it's about the fact that I was lucky. We can't, we all go through pain and suffering and we just can't we all deserve that sort of support and we need that to be part of our society and uh, shouldn't be just luck that ensures that you, you know, all parents can get through this period of time. I feel like I talk when it comes to public policy, certainly the issues that you're covering, we talk a lot about, I think, opportunity and resources and what you had were resources after your tragedy. Other people have tragedies or just start in a, in, a, in a rough spot and don't have resources or or opportunities. And I feel like that's the the disconnection that you're pointing out 
with your situation versus so many other people who have fewer resources and opportunities. Is that fair? Absolutely. Although, you know, at that moment in time, I was like, oh, my gosh, am I going to be able to keep a roof over my head? But of course, I'm a physician. I would I, I you sort of forget all of that. But that's exactly right. I mean, at the end of the day, all parents want the same for their kids. They just want to get them to the other side of adulthood, have all the opportunities in this world. And so often time and resources are the things that are, you know, in most limited supply. And, you know, I, our country needs to sort of value, start aligning our values with what we do and investing in parents as the guardians of our future, in truth. And I want to get into all of that, but let's do the other part that you always do. The other bit. You're funny yeah. uh, about your, your, oh, your, 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 stop your, it. <laughs> you're an MD, you're a surgeon, you, you, you have clinics. Um, I don't, I, you're such a, a highbrow surgeon. I can't even pronounce your specialty, <laughs> but I believe what you do is you use this amazing technology to help children who can't hear, hear. Uh, and, and I think, see, I'm not I'm terrible at even describing what you do. What is it that you do and how does that lead you into public policy? Yeah, well, you know, so I am a pediatric cochlear implant surgeon. Can you say that three times? Cochlear uh, implant surgeon. I, I got uh, that part. Exactly. Perfect. So basically what I do is I implant an, an amazing piece of technology that allows a child born deaf the ability to hear, to talk, and to really mainstream educationally and socially. And really it was my experience as a physician seeing huge outcomes, differences amongst my patients after implantation with some thriving and others not reaching their developmental potential that really sort of in some ways pushed me out of the operating room to try to figure out why this was and more importantly, what I could do about it. And it led me on this crazy journey, but um, into the world of social sciences, public policy here with you. And it's not just because of my my humorous uh, <laughs> attributes that brought me to you. And but it really shows you how all things and I can explain to you in greater detail the science. But that at the end of the day, until we figure out the investment of children in children and families, everything is going to be affected negatively in our country. So, well, your first book, your last book, uh, 30 million words deals a lot with this. So, so w tell me a little bit about what you learned in terms of when children can hear uh, how much of a difference yeah. it makes. And then going, of course, back to the, the, the resources and opportunity issue. Absolutely. So, you know, in that journey that I started on to try to figure out why it was, I, I w was exposed to, I'm at the University of Chicago. I actually audited a class on child development, as crazy it is, as it is. And I learned about this research study, which basically showed, followed all these little kids in Kansas City and basically in trying to figure out why some kids did better than others. And obviously it's very complex, but their research basically showed that by the end of the age of three, some children will have heard 30, 30 million fewer words than other children. Obviously that was one tiny bit of it, but it basically led me into this research showing how important the first three years of life are, how critical parents and caregivers with their talk and interaction is for building children's brains. They are children's brain architects and how these early years really set up all children for their educational trajectories and to give all children an equal chance. And it's not just children born with hearing loss. It's really all children. You need a rich early language environment with parents and caregivers being given the opportunity to provide that. Now, I know that you've talked about how that study that that was based on w had some real flaws and was, uh, I guess, was unable. Uh, other researchers were unable to, to to recreate it. But that doesn't necessarily change the the mission or the the root of the problem. I think it's fair to say. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. So, so you know, like many, you know, studies, it was far from perfect. Uh, and I can go through all the flaws. But really, it's a first sentence in a in a huge literature that shows that talk and interaction, that nurturing interaction and protection from toxic stress is what literally builds a child's brain. I always say that, look, it was 
it was sticky enough to pull a surgeon from the operating room because, you know, I am a self-trained social scientist and it was, it was that compelling hook. But if that was it, trust me, that would not be enough. It's really all the science that has come afterwards to show us what children need in the early years to get a fair chance. Can I just like, I want to just, I want to get into all the details and the science and everything you talk about, but I kind of also want to cut to the chase of I've been talking with early education experts, child psychologists and, and the like for, for my whole career. And the one thing that I often all the time hear at these statistics about the research, of course, that you reference as well is about how much happens during those first few years. And so much of the solution, I mean, a huge part of the solution, people say, would be uh, a daycare or or universal pre-K and how much of a difference that makes for a child's development. When you look at specifically Europe and even Asian countries, they do this. They do this very differently. You're talking and mostly focused on the problem in America. So my, my question is, how much, how much different are, is what they do in other nations uh, th- than what we do to, to point to how broken it is here, I feel? Yeah. Well, just to clarify one thing, I mean, pre-K is critically important, but even pre-K is not early enough. Those first three years of life when 85 percent of the brain is built and, you know, you get a million new neural connections connecting the brain. We that is the area that we've really been ignoring. And let me tell you, we are an outlier compared to almost any other developed nation um, in understanding the importance of investing in the early years in parents and caregivers. And I can, if you want, I can, you know, list off all the ways that we are different, but let's just put it this way. One of the best examples is the fact that, that, you know, the average investment in toddler childcare in all sort of developed nations is about $14,000 per year. Forget about, Nor- you know, Norway, Denmark places, which are 29000 In our country, we invest a total of $500 per year. The, we, we, we have a vacuum of support in those first three years of life, and we're paying, we're paying for it. Yeah, that's for sure. And that, that that's something that's always worth mentioning and going into. I just wanted to be sure that uh, that you kind of agreed with that. But more specifically, you're talking about even earlier than that. And, and that's and that's really important. The research you research and there's a lot of research that actually goes into families homes, which is what you talk about in, in the book, which I think is super interesting because you, it's the best way to communicate to folks listening or who want to know what what the problems are, because you actually do the research in the home with the actual family. Tell me a little bit about what you've learned so we can kind of illustrate what the problems are. Yeah. So to differentiate, one is, you know, in the programs that we've developed really to share the science and how powerful parents are, we we actually met parents where they are. That's not what I'm suggesting, you know, nationwide. It was part of the research that we were doing. And what was amazing is we Families embrace the science, right? They embrace these, what we call the three T's for building their children's brains. But what I found, and this is really the next step of my journey, is that despite all this, society put roadblock after roadblock after roadblock in front of families. I mean, the families that we work with, amazing families, you know, had to deal with everything from homelessness to the gig economy where they had less than, you know, 30 minutes with their kids to the carceral state where a father was separated from his dad, from his son for five years waiting for trial, which exonerated him. Yeah, that's so, a crazy story. Just an insane yeah. story. You say exonerated him in a day and a half. He was, in a day and a half. It's almost even insulting that you took five years to give this poor man a trial while he was separated from his son. And then in a day and a half, they're like, oops, yeah, we have no DNA. We have no reason to think you are. I mean, the guy, let's just put it, the guy who theoretically did the um, murder was five, six. This guy, Michael is six, three, like seriously, you know, well, I mean, um, it's, it's probably not the most common of issues, a false accusation, taking a man from his family, but it is, we could talk about criminal justice uh, and, and how so often it does break up families. But I mean, you're just pointing to how this go ahead. What happened here was I interrupted you. I, I, yeah, no, 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 but it's exactly right. I mean, that is that is not a common thing, but it, what it is is just one more evidence of the way society disregards the importance of parents and caregivers 
fathers in the important role of building the next generation. I can, you know, I, in writing this book, I initially started with the powerful families of the families that I worked with that, you know, have become friends, amazing humans, but I expanded it, right? COVID-19 hit and all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, never has it been clear that we have completely abandoned families, children and families, especially in the early years when they could use the most support. So I have all different political, racial, ethnic, religious backgrounds. You hear the same stories over and over again, parents struggling and without choice. You know, we talk a lot about choice. We give parents no choice in this country. Um, yeah, well, let's let's get you. You talk about uh, society is abdicating its responsibility here in, in the United States of America. I want to replace society with government, but I know that doesn't fit. I know that doesn't work. I know it's not just about uh, public policy solutions at the local state or or national level. It has to be something about that that we all are doing for each other. It has to certainly be about companies, small and large, uh, providing health care um, and, and so many other things that we could talk about. But when you say society, break that down for me, that we're we yeah. are abdicating. Yeah, no, it would be to, you know, certainly there's an important role for policy at every level. But I, I, I sort of I sort of make the analogy of that really puts children and families at the center is like building a healthy brain. It's not only one part of the brain for reading, right? It takes the entire brain. So it takes the entire society to really support children and caregivers. It takes employers. I think Corporate America can play a huge role in leading this effort because they're suffering, too, um, because of you know, the loss of talent. It takes health care. Health care, obviously, I come from, plays a huge role in sort of filling the gap of support for children and families in the early years because we don't have school. Right. How do you meet? How do you reach families and support them? Health care. I think parents, parents and caregivers play a huge role. This is not just, you know both in galvanizing, providing support, providing community, and then, of course, policy. Policy, you know, plays, plays a critical role. So all of those things need to come together to really build this idea of a parent nation or whatever you want to call it. Well, how do we... I'm so intimately familiar now, personally now, in my local town board of elections campaign fight... Uh, uh, I'm so intimately familiar with the divide and this isn't really a political book. Uh, maybe it's a political problem. I, I don't know, but how do we talk about parenting, which is a divisive issue, even without all of the new things that we've come up with to hate each other over or to be divided over. How do we talk about that in a unifying way? You say things like uh, parental choice. That's what I'm hearing now. Uh, you know, from from these folks on the right saying we want a ha to have a say in, in what our kids are learning. And, and my argument, of course, is you do. There's a billion. I use them all the time. You can talk to the teachers, the administ administrators, the principal. You can make suggestions. You can volunteer. Learn about it. We have that choice. But it feels like we're not even speaking the same language. And you are. You, you speak all these languages to all different kinds of <laughs> constituencies, Dana. Yeah, well. I think that, it, first of all, you know, much of the focus of the book and the work is, for me, the early years when the foundation of brain development is. And when, ironically, we have a vacuum of supports that affect all parents from all backgrounds, except for the top one percent. So with that being said, I think it's important to remind us about the fact that there, what it, what universally binds us, our love for ch our ch children and the desire to give them every opportunity. And by really focusing on those first years of life, when most give nothing, I spoke to parents from literally all different backgrounds. I mean, I know that there's the, the fight in the later years that, you know, it, it's, it's less about the, ch you know, we could we could spend a whole bunch of time discussing it, but I prefer focusing on those early years when I spoke to all different backgrounds, all different, you know, homeschoolers, um, people who voted on the right, who voted on the left. And I, and I, when I said, look, if I gave you a, a magic wand, what would society look like? What would the supports that you would need to be able to parent the way that you want look like? I took off all the language related to policy and everything like that that gets everybody's hair standing up. And I have to tell you, Pete, 
almost to a T, almost everybody wanted the same things. At the end of the day, they just want to be able to give their kids the time and resources so that they can get the opportunity. And they want to find the joy in parenting. I don't think people realize how much the lack of supports from all different parts of society has sucked the joy that we d- deserve to have while parenting. We all love our children, but you know, I don't know if you know, there's really rich research to show that parents in general are less happy than non-parents. And, and in the study that Jennifer Glass uh, and her colleagues did, she showed that in our country, compared to any other country, this is where we exceed. We have the largest gap between happiness gap between parents and non-parents. So we want to be happy. We want to raise our kids. We want to not feel divided. And I think, you know, this is an opportunity. So. I, I I don't want to make anything myopic or minimize that problem. But I feel like one of the issues and reasons for that is because in this country, as happened to me, if you lose your corporate job or your your job with the insurance, you lose your insurance That'll weigh on your marriage, I can tell you. My wife is an independent contractor. I now am an independent contractor. Thanks to Obamacare, there's affordable insurance now for people like us. But the point being, the worst thing in the world is to lose access to affordable health care. Not for you, but for your, I'm not worried about me necessarily. We didn't have any chronic issues. As soon as I lost my insurance, my daughter gets diagnosed with scoliosis needs all kinds of treatment, potentially surgery, a very expensive brace. And it was horrible. It was horrible. And my wife, I remember breaking down going, how do people that don't speak English navigate this system? The point being, parents in America are more stressed out and less happy because we have to worry about having access to health care for our kids. Sorry for the rant, but that to me seems like a pretty big difference. Well, well, as a health care provider, I am all in, in, in terms of what you're talking about. And, you know, actually one of the stories from the book, Jade, who, you know, who came from the evangelical community, whose dream was to be a stay at home mom because of the lack of health care and health insurance. And her husband, who was a student teacher, the lack of a living wage after her child and had to go right back to work, working at Starbucks, which thankfully had good benefits. But, you know, I, you, you make an important point. There is the time to be able to provide your children resources, but then also to be able to deal with the economic shocks and the life shocks, sort of like going back to my losing my husband. You, you need, you know, a strong raft to get you through those tough times. And I don't think people realize that in this country back, you know, half a century ago when you had a good job at you know, the Chrysler plant and you had benefits and you knew your kids were going to be okay. You know, we were able to give our kids that opportunity because we had the bandwidth and we, we had not the mental stresses that we do now. And it it doesn't have to be that way. That's a funny thing is when you look, I don't know if you've ever seen this awesome, I give you this visual for it. The awesome, awesome visual of the GDP of our country compared to any other country. We are a gross domestic product dwarfs every other country, including China. And you're telling me that we can't have paid family and medical leave, which actually helps the bottom line, gets women back to work and doing all of those things. We, you know, it. It doesn't have to be that way. And I've I've tried to become a better uh, interviewer when interviewing an expert like you and not go off on another rant about what you just said about GDP. So instead, (laughs) I'm going to read from your excellent book, Parent Nation, about Jade, who you said, thank goodness for Starbucks. She's evangelical. uh, As you mentioned, you you talk with all kinds of different people and, 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 and research all kinds of different backgrounds. You write, Jade considers herself quite a traditional mother, yet sees the limits of the choices society currently allows. She imagines a world where employers acknowledge how hard it can be to juggle work and family, including during reviews. She would love to see higher salaries and reasonably priced health care. She's adamant she doesn't want free money. She doesn't want a handout or to be thought of as lazy. She encourages her children to pray and ask God for help, but she wouldn't ask anyone else. Nevertheless, She knows what it's like to feel totally on your own at a time when you most need support. You're a wonderful writer. It's an amazing and important chapter. Yeah, You mentioned Jade. I wanted to mention that. Um, Anything else you want to add about her or somebody else's story? 
Yeah, no, I, well, I mean, going to the, you know, along the parent choice sort of mantra, you know, we always say in this country, it's all about parental choice. I mean, I, I thought a lot about why, how did we end up in this place? I mean, like literally so different than any other places. And, you know, that, that thread of American individualism that, you know, you have to be tough and independent and go it alone, I think sort of inculcated itself into this parenting mantra and especially, you know, all parents and forgive me, you know, often mothers sort of sort of suck this idea in so that when things became hard, there was another mother, Talia, who is a PhD at the University of Chicago, incredible research researcher who had to step back from her job because in her words, she felt like she was failing in all parts of her life. Right. She couldn't afford for child care, would have to take out loans to be able to, you know, advance science and just couldn't do it. And I thought, gosh, you know, here she feels like she's failing in all parts of her life. When with instead of saying, well, why is society failing me? So I can't, you know, both build the next generation of children and, you know, provide my knowledge to society. It's just crazy. It, it, the, 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 the word choice infuriates me. It infuriates me because the choices that I had and my parents had were were all they had almost all of the choices when I was growing up. They could we could do almost anything we wanted. The choices some of my friends that I now know at age 46 uh, through my work and so on that didn't have those resources were like two or one. I'll never forget uh, a, a guy explaining to me in the neighborhood that he grew up. He thought the most the most successful thing you could be would be to sell drugs because those guys uh, walked around with a lot of money and had nice cars and so on. It's a matter of the choices that you see presented to you as a child, as an adolescent, and even, of course, as a parent. So when people say it, it, it's your fault, you're there, you should have made better choices, you should be more personally responsible, it infuriates me because – I simply know that we don't all have the same choices. We don't even know that those choices exist. It's almost best illustrated through a boy. So many boys who grew up rich think that they, they end up just doing the job their dad did. It's like they didn't know there were other jobs, but of course there are. The, the choice should be put in quotes and it should be blown up is how I feel. Sorry for another rant. <laughs> or we can insist that we that we that society makes good on right. this promise. And, you know, the whole sort of personal responsibility mantra really was used at some level to shift the burden, you know, and the risks. There's a great book called The Great The the big shift. No, no, the great shift. Um, but, but basically how, you know, much of the risks of life and society was born on the big shoulders of corporate America back, you know, 50 plus years ago. And the shift now has been placed on the fragile shoulders of the American workers, which, you know, has then, you know, impacted children and families. That's the, that's a huge part of the thinking in the book is that we often think of early childhood simply about, you know, child care, paid leave, which of course these are critically important things, but the fact that so many people have no benefits, right? To weather the storms of life is a huge huge impact both on their mental health, their ability to weather it and on and on our children. And that's why, like, you know, the idea of portable benefits, I see as equally important to to children as it is to adults and yep. part of a parent nation. Yes. So. And anybody who's an entrepreneur or a capitalist should love portable benefits because you don't want to be in the job lock where you have a great idea widget that you could sell, but you can't leave your job because you can't you can't fund a month or two uh, yeah. trying to start a new business. What is the brain's greatest trick, Dana? The brain's greatest trick is the idea of neuroplasticity, the ability to rewire itself. And it is at the heart of why humans are the smartest most innovative of all species um, and the first three years of life. So, you know, in the early days, in those three years, first three years of life, the, the brain comes out of the mom unformed, right? Pretty much unformed. Und unlike your heart and lungs that's fully formed, your brain is waiting for an instruction guide 
from its world, uh, from the world around it. So if you are born into a rich early language environment with lots of language and math and spatial talk, your brain wires expecting that sort of input to uh, come in. And that's why kids who have a lot of language input early on start off school more ready to learn. At the same time, if a brain and a baby is born into a very inhospitable environment, a one with lots of toxic stress because of, you know, the issues of, uh, you know, poverty, et cetera, that will impact how it wires up. It's not, you know, people think of it good versus bad, but I think of it as it's just, it's environment is telling the brain how to wire up. So that's why those early years are so critical to ex um Left, sorry, to to let it have all that nurturing input so that it can be ready for school and the learning that we want, you know, all children to be. Have. Uh, um, it's not that I'm sorry. I, I just want to emphasize it's not that neuroplasticity plasticity in the brain's ability to learn ends as you get my age or, you know, in adolescence. No, your brain always rewires itself. It's just that those first three years of life are the critical period. The research on that uh, early childhood, I mean, it's 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 really conclusive, right? Like, I mean, like I never I don't I, I don't I haven't made it my business to, to, to try to debunk it because I think that people who do such things are Google warriors. But I haven't seen anything in, in, in some light searches. I mean, it's it's pretty conclusive of, of, of what you're talking about in those early years and brain development. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Look, if anybody who, who wants to try to debunk it, if they put their children child into a closet and don't talk to them, then I'll believe that they actually believe it. <laughs> um, the truth is, is that <laughs> there's a whole reason there. There is a lot of science showing that talking, interacting, reading, you know, playing, you know, what is, if, is critical for brain development. What if it's oh, yeah. a, what if you're very well off? It's a huge walk-in closet. It's, it's got screens and <laughs> Wi-Fi and a uh, dry bar. I mean, is that really that does bad? It, does, does it have a lot of good shoes? Because put me in there. I, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm imagined. <laughs> what do you wear during surgery? Uh, shoes wise, you standing the whole time? No, no, no. You sit under the microscope. You so do. because I'm operating on the cochlea, which is literally like a pea size, um, uh, sized anatomy, you know, you, I look under a microscope. I'll, I'll show you a cool picture of me under the, but I don't wear high heels. Although I can tell you a really funny story from when I was a resident. Um, when I was a resident, it was back when there were a lot less women going into surgery. And I was literally the only one out of 25 male surgical interns at the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, no, no, it, it, I mean, look, I, thankfully things have changed dramatically. I had a great experience, but I remember what I thought was a really complimentary um, statement by my chief resident. We were switching from one rotation to another. And the chief resident said to the, another young male intern, he said, you know, about me, now you've got some high heels to fill, sir. And I thought, oh, well, that, that sounded sort of cool. I don't, I don't know how people would take it now, but I, I took it as he thought I was doing a good job. Although I didn't wear high heels, although I am short. Um, I really want to know more about that surgery and, and, and everything else about your, I mean, now I'm just like, well, first of all, why did you do that? Why would you at that point in time, given the, the, the state of, of medicine and gender and women, like, why would you go into... I guess probably that specialty I'm, was those numbers similar in in anybody pursuing a, a, a medical degree, or was that sp you know something to deal with auditory issues or or your specific practice? But like, why would you do that? Why would you be the only woman? Why would you do that? Well, so first of all, it was in general. Uh, you start off in general surgery, and then you go into ENT. You know, it was. I, I must admit, I didn't really think about it. I felt I was almost going to be a neurosurgeon where probably there would be even less women. Yeah. Um, but I fell in love with surgery, even though, you know, I'm um, many. I just fell in love with it. And uh, so and that I, didn't so that it, that you fell in love, you it didn't matter. The, the gender issue being, you know, the only woman didn't matter because, you know, you loved what you were doing. I love what I was doing. And I had many supportive you know, uh, attending. So I didn't, uh, you know, I'm sure I can tell you different experiences, but on the whole, at the University of Pennsylvania, at least at that point, 
or, or maybe I just didn't notice and I ignored them. Um, you had to be sort of strong will at that time. But, uh, yeah, I had, uh, I, I had, a, I had a fun time. Well, that's good to hear. I'm glad to hear that that's, uh, that's the story. Um, well, I want to talk more, just a couple more questions if we have time. Parent Nation, unlocking child's, every child's potential, fulfilling society's promise, going back to the book, and, and the movement that you've really started and, and the organization. You know, when our friend Heidi Stevens, our mutual friend, reached out to me, she's a former columnist for the, the Chicago Tribune, of course, and, like, if she said interview this person or that person, I wouldn't do any research. I'd say when I have so much trust in her credibility that, you know, I, I would always say yes, but she also left her career in journalism to work for this organization, to work with you. Talk to me about what you guys are trying to do. Absolutely. So I want to clarify. It is not, I am not the one starting a movement. We are trying to join and elevate so many people across the country who are doing who are doing this type of work who care about this um i'm always you know very wary of one person starting anything uh at the same like you i i feel like one of my great gifts is surrounding myself and enticing really incredible people to work with me on issues and purposes greater than ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I had met uh, Heidi, actually she interviewed me. How do you like that? She interviewed me and then I recruited her over. She is just, well, you know, Heidi, she's just, you know, she interviewed, incredible. She, she interviewed me too. I wasn't even familiar with, you know, with her work and she reached out cause I was working on a parenting initiative and, and she wrote a whole column about it. And it was one of the most amazing things in my career and life to be recognized that way and to hopefully think I made any kind of difference. She's an amazing journalist. So she interviews you and goes at, and what happened? And no, uh, we just kept in touch a little bit. I think she interviewed me again. And, you know, the, this larger idea of building a parent nation, um, and we can talk at some other time. We, We've got the economic case. We've got the scientific case. We've got the fact that most people in this country want and demand, you know, desire support in the early years. I mean, this is not a partisan issue. You can almost ask anyone and nobody thinks that it's OK that one in four mothers go back to work after 25 after two weeks of giving birth. So it's really about pushing this forward. So I surrounded myself with Heidi Stevens to translate it and to elevate stories from across the country of people doing this, because we've got to get that out there. A woman, Yuli Flores, who is just a dynamo, um, who helped create, she's, you know, creating the ground game, working with organizations and parents and groups to really bring voices together because they are all, you know, when you're dispersed across the nation, not talking as one voice, sometimes that you can't tell that there are so many people who agree. So there are, uh, there are a number of people on the team here to towards building a parent nation. And really we want to partner with people across the, the country. Um, ultimately, honestly, Pete, I think the only way we're going to dramatically move things forward is if we bring voices together and not just, you know, in March, but we need to be smart and strategic and savvy. I mean, the AARP, which I, you know, I talk about in the book is a great example of an, a group that has transformed what it is to be elderly in this country back, you know, 50 plus years ago, they were the poorest, most underserved population. And through, through the gray lobby and Social Security and Medicare, no group is better cared for. And justifiably, they have given to this country. We need the same for parents. And um, that's yeah. such, no, that's such a really good point. And it, 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 it makes me want to do more research on that movement because, you know, that organization, along with others, uh, advocated, lobbied. They lobbied. They got government policy changed and seniors in America live a, a, a pretty good life equivalent and more more likely to other nations. And why can't we have the same for children and families? Last question. I think it's such an important one and there's no wrong or right answer other than the premise is always seemingly true from your research and, and mine. And anecdotally, we feel alone in our problems as parents. I feel like nobody else is working as much as me. I feel like nobody else 
is having the same problems with their kids as I am. And even if they are, I'm insecure to talk about it with anybody, especially, by, by the way, I'll argue men. Uh, we, men have a much harder, I think, uh, la- lack of social support in any way, much less formally. Uh, moms tend to talk a little bit more, I think. So so is that true? Are we alone? And what can be done? Yeah. You know, what you're expressing is what I heard over and over again from moms and dads within in the book from all different backgrounds. That is a universal, this feeling that they are alone in the struggles of parenting. And, you know, uh, before I tell you what we need to do, I mean, this is actually borne out here. My scientist had um, in research, a woman, Caitlin Collins, who is an awesome researcher, Wash U, looked at at this in this point, uh, mothers across many nations, and this idea of guilt, you know, maternal guilt, was a was a singular U.S. phenomenon. You know, you talk to women; it's really hilarious. It's really interesting because you think, oh, I feel guilty for being not a great parent would be a universal. I mean, I feel that way all the time. And but no, I mean, in other countries in like the Norway, Denmark, they're like, what guilt? I don't I don't get it. In Italy, there's not guilt, but like anger at like the lack of policy support. So they don't externalize they externalize it. We internalize it. Um, But but the but that's an important point, because in some ways, it is a symptom of a country that has convinced you that it's all on you, Pete. You know what? When you're feeling this way, it's all on you. Yep. You should be ashamed. Yep. You should be you're failing. And part of the work that we're and actually even in the research realm, if you ever want to nerd out, is really to dig into this, because that is a phenomenon that that also not only makes you feel bad and impacts your mental health, but in some ways paralyzes us um, because you're going to less likely advocate for policy changes, both governmental or in your work, when you feel like it's on you. So we need a shift in norms of saying, you know what, none of us parent alone. Society and social supports are critical for me to be able to parent the way that I want. And by like ripping off the, you know, the, what is it called? The, the, not the embarrassment, but you know, the fact that we keep it in, stigma, you know, today. Right? And we can, that, that is how we need to move forward change. It's not just to make you feel better, Pete, which I want it to, because that's going to impact how you parent, but that's an important part of change. So none of us parent alone. Yeah, no. And I, 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 and the effect that that has on your kids, like your struggle has an effect on your kids. If you're feeling isolated and, and, and not adequate as a parent that directly has an effect on your kids. So parent nation. Absolutely. Uh, the Let's book is amazing. The organization is is amazing. You uh, personally are just a, such an impressive person. What you've done with your no. career, with your life, and how you've turned adversity into an, a, an amazing, amazing, I think, opportunity, and 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 that you've created for so many other people. ParentNation.org. Dana, thank you so much for talking to me, and I hope that we can talk again. And I want to get in, in more involved in any way I can. Would love it. Thank you so much. All right, there you go, Dr. Dana Suskind. Were the drops, were they intolerable? Could you deal with it? Let me know. What is the review of the audio quality of that interview? I always like to know what your standards are. Her new book, Parent Nation, go get it. And, of course, her last book, 30 Million Words, which the study I mentioned, that, that the book in a lot of that work, or some of the book at least, some of it relied on was, of course, flawed. We talked about that. I'll talked with Aaron Carroll about it before I talked to her, but this is, and she is, so worth connecting with and getting this book and, and learning from it. I can't wait to talk to her again. Thank you to Tim Wise, as well as always, follow and support Tim, and thank you for all of you who support this podcast. I am going to go post it up now for you to listen to, and I hope to hear from you. Check out the Discord platform subscribers if you're looking for moral support or ways to connect with other folks that listen to the show check that out and i'll see you at the hangout on thursday john carroll our own we love him and i look forward to seeing him too soon taking us out right now the song he wrote just for us and for everybody else you can go buy it right now go to johncarroll.org by the way you gotta stay
Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 